as common challenges around fending off an aggressive authoritarian giant draw both countries increasingly closer. We take a deeper look today at the warming tides between Taiwan and Ukraine, from strategic defense to citizen-to-citizen -citizen exchanges, and what this means for the future. Hi, and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I am Catherine Liu. I'm Rath Wang. Joining us in the studio today is Leonard Chow, adjunct professor at National Tsinghua University and former Taiwan ambassador to the Kingdom of Eswatini, an expert in international relations, and Oleksandr Shin, founder of Ukrainian Voices, a hub of Ukrainian researchers aimed at promoting citizen diplomacy between Taiwan and Ukraine. He is also the coordinator for Ukraine Plus Taiwan Forum, an advocacy platform to promote ties between both nations by the Liberal Democratic League of Ukraine. Oleg is a native of Ukraine, but is of Korean descent and is an academic currently based in Taipei. I spoke earlier to Hanna Hopko, chairwoman of the Democracy in Action and former Ukrainian member of parliament and the former head of the Committee on Foreign Affairs during her recent visit to Taipei as part of the Ukrainian parliament delegation. And we also hear from Mykola Janivsky, Ukrainian Member of Parliament and the co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. Mykola spoke with our chief host, Ian Kavat, during his trip to Taiwan with the Interparliamentary Alliance on China delegation. Let's first start today's discussion around the similarities and differences between Taiwan and Ukraine and the unique advantages each country appears to have. My first question goes to you, Oleg. Um, I wanted to ask you about your fascinating story growing up in Ukraine to Korean parents. Mm. Could you share with us what brought you to Taiwan? I mean, there's many reasons why I wanted, really wanted to come to Taiwan, but I guess one of the main reasons is um, how diverse the society here is and how creative the people are. I feel like this well, historical diversity that, you know, then uh, sort of manifests in what Taiwan is today, exploring this diverse identity. It's something that's really close to Ukraine, I feel mm. like, and resonates with many Ukrainian people. You mean the struggle of one identity because there is a diverse choice? Yes, exactly. How to define identity, especially in the context of, you know, uh, having been denied the right to define yourself for such a long time, especially, well, in the light of, you know, genocidal rhetorics by neighboring countries that deny our right to be ourselves and call ourselves whatever we want. I feel in that context, our Ukrainian and Taiwanese conquest in, um, in uh, uh, defining ourselves in our own words, it's really meaningful and important. Your background is really unique in the sense that you're also an ethnic minority within Ukraine. Yes. If you could talk about that experience and also with how that connects to Taiwan and mm. how Taiwan's trying to build this new identity amidst um, Chinese aggression and um, being different from a giant, powerful, authoritarian neighbor. Mm, mm, mm. So I'm Korean-Ukrainian, uh, and um, I descend from the so-called Soviet Koreans or Korea Koreans. And these are Koreans who lived in the Soviet Union, and they pretty much faced uh, a lot of those atrocities that we hear about when we think about Soviet Union. So deportations, mass imprisonments, uh, repressions, harsh assimilation policies. So we've lost our language due to that. We've lost a huge portion of our culture and identity and communities. So, mm. um, so when I say I reject Russian colonialism and Russian claims over Ukraine, I do that not just as a Ukrainian citizen, but mm. also as a Korean Ukrainian. Ah, oh, nice. Because see. on both levels, um, Russian imperialism, imperialism has been something that was very, very hurtful towards our communities, and um, yeah, and that I feel like it's only my duty to mm. be. How does that resonate it? with Taiwan? Like, yeah. Do you feel it re resonates with Taiwan's mm -hmm. past authoritarian? Um, 30, 40 years of martial law, how, you know, language has been suppressed and, you know, with indigenous peoples mm. and different yes. Han groups. I feel like, well, I've studied indigenous language education policy and revitalization in Taiwan. Mm. And I feel like in Taiwan, this issue of identity, it's much more multi-layered than in Ukraine, but nonetheless, it exists. Mm. And a lot of it depends on how um, some identities are imposed on Taiwan or Ukraine mm -hmm. from the outside by countries that are stronger, 
that are more vocal internationally mm. and have more diplomatic and not only power. In that sense, I feel like um, Taiwan and Ukraine are very similar. similar and to um, that sense. Yeah, in Taiwan, it's a little bit, I feel like, more multi layered, and there's all well, this, the struggle needs to be defined in much more. Um, in much more uh, description than mm. in Ukraine, but nonetheless. Multi-layered in terms of ethnicities or in yes. terms of... Yes, Taiwan is much more diverse than Ukraine and Taiwan's history is, I feel like, um, it's brought people with very various ideas uh, towards this discussion nowadays. In Ukraine, it's, it's a little bit um, more straightforward. Mm. So we had Russian colonialism, Soviet, well, we defined as Soviet right. Russian colonialism, mm -hmm. and then into Ukraine. While in Taiwan, there was, you know, several waves of migration, indigenous people, Han people, but also Han minorities mm -hmm. and people who speak different languages. So and complex. also European colonialism. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You've been in Taiwan for many years. Um, did you see a drastic change in terms of identity after Ukraine, uh, in, uh, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Mm, well, I haven't spent that much time here, just one year, mm -hmm. and, but yeah, I feel like this year, especially with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, I do see a big change in what, at least what Taiwanese people say and the way they communicate um, their country's position in the world right now. It's a little bit different from my perspective to, to what it used to be. Now I feel like Taiwanese people are more bold in uh, making the statement that they are Taiwanese, that they're nothing else, and that just like in Ukraine these days. Is it a more diverse identity or is it more the same answer in terms of, you know, I'm a Taiwanese, I'm mm -hmm. willing to defend my country, your observation? Um, I do feel like there's more Taiwanese people who say they are willing to defend their country, yes, for sure. After and, the war, yeah. And defending not only with weapon in their hands, but mm -hmm. also being, you know, actively and vocally Taiwanese, mm. especially when they go into international area and speak in front of people from other countries. Mm. As if Ukraine had served as a wake-up <clears throat> call for Taiwan. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I feel like yeah. both our societies were conditioned not to speak about ourselves for a very long time, you know, because for various are, reasons, yeah. we can't simply. And we're a minority, yeah. right? In, in the States, for example, Taiwanese Americans are a minority compared to non, well, Chinese, Chinese mm. uh, and Ukrainian uh, community as well. Wherever we go, we're always less than Russians. Mm. So let's say if there is a battle less of Russians. truths, yeah, yeah. their truth wins naturally because there's more of them. So we need to be more vocal and we need to be stronger in the way we declare to the world that we, we are who we are, not what they say we are. Well, but as far as I know, there are some people in Ukraine who are pro-Russia. Well, what happened to them after you know, this war continued for like almost a year? I feel like the pro-Russian uh, part of our society was quite a minority, but then again, people who lived, uh, you know, in, in the areas which were closer were, to East Border, yes, yeah. and were historically more Russified. Um, so, I, I specifically What's your attitude come after? from one of those areas. Yeah. yeah. So after the second invasion, I feel like attitudes changed a lot because now for people, it's it's not ambiguous anymore. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much clear that Russia is the nation that came here to invade. Mm -hmm. And then if you see at the map uh, of Ukraine, most of the cities that were razed completely or destroyed and where massive killings happened are Russian speaking mm -hmm. cities where the proportion of Russian supporters or, you know, just people who weren't so sure about the situation mm -hmm. now has defined their final stance that Russia is the enemy and Russia the is the one who's killing people around them, literally, mm. in front of their eyes. It's not happening in the west of Ukraine where people are historically more, uh, you know, more nationalist or more pro-Ukrainian. Well, speaking of war, we're talking about right now, Ambassador, I'm so curious, your expertise, I'm curious about Biden's um, attitude toward Taiwan and mm. Ukraine. They're so different because there's four times that Biden said out loud, the international press, mm. you know, write it down and said uh, Biden's willing to defend Taiwan. But when it comes to Ukraine, um, well, you can you can look at the current event right now. Um, they are willing to provide some sort of um, help, but not willing to send out troops and fight other people's war. What's the main difference here? 
Well, okay. <clears throat> I think we all record that you know Biden has been uh, you know uh, making this same expression for uh, four times in mm -hmm. a row. And last time, if my memory serves me right, mm -hmm. he was saying that in Asia, in Japan, in re in response to a, a question from the media there. So, but what Biden yes. said that U.S. would like to send troops yes. to to help Taiwan. Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, naturally, okay. President Biden's, you know, the, the words of these kinds, such kinds are appreciated by us. But uh, you, you, we also have to, uh, you know, uh, remember that, you know, these words, you know, they have been uh, almost without exceptions, clarified, if not corrected, yeah. by the White House or State, State Department officials. Okay. We we'll remain one child That's policy. Right. They're on the same, the next yeah. day, you know, they all, you know, uh, so I yeah. think like, 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 you know, a two way in a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a show or something like that. Biden says something and his staff say the other way around. So, but I think, so uh, this, those uh, White House and State Department officials from their words, meaning that, they're, they're they say U.S. is not changing its original one China policy. Uh, existing one-China yeah. policy. Yeah. Meaning what? Meaning that it's not been confirmed that, okay, confirmed that the U.S. should be willing sending troops to Taiwan. So I think that remains to be seen, okay? So I think uh, it's still we have to be, uh, to, have to be careful. In, because uh, Biden's words, I, I, I know, I assume that he meant well. He, he meant kind to Taiwanese. But, you know, it's a personal, okay, made personal expression. But we have to look it up, you know, for the, uh, the, the government's real practical uh, policy. Does They're that also, mean we shouldn't believe Biden for what he said? Well, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we, we can believe, you know, his sense of uh, kindness. <laughs> okay, let me put it this way. But for, for real action, that remains to be, uh, to be, you know, examined. Okay. But there does seem to be an increasing consensus that um, whatever means that is, you know, between Taiwan and China has to be solved peacefully. And um, I think the State Department has mentioned that, and also the Department of yeah. Defense, and also Biden. The administration has been consistent, and despite what Biden has said four times, but before that, there was more of an ambiguity. Mm. So do you feel that there's more commitment from the U.S. towards least, Taiwan as opposed to Ukraine, where from the yeah. beginning they yeah. said that there won't be boots on the ground? The commitment from the United States it could remain you know, for sure. Okay, now I don't say that they're going to you know uh, you know uh, kind of you know change their commitment from the beginning. But it's a difference between the way U.S. You know, uh, treated Ukraine and or treated Taiwan in this regard. It might be different. As you know, that, as I mentioned earlier, that, and ever since the, the beginning of the, the war in Ukraine, mm. the U.S., you know, I think President Biden, he's, he's, he's personally said that very clearly that we're not going to send troops to Ukraine. I think there may be some certain background you know, behind you know, his words. Maybe his words so carefully, you know, uh, uh, you know, carefully uh, designed. Maybe because of the conclusion of his staff's collective discussion about mm. that, because this is something very serious. So we have to, uh, we have to, you know, unify our, you know, uh, policy toward the, you know, in public. So, so Biden said that, but instead, U.S. has been providing many kinds of weapons to Ukraine ever since, you know, late February, as you know that. But for Taiwan, uh, okay, the U.S., uh, according to the TRA, mm. you know, Taiwan Relations Act, mm. the United States is, will provide Taiwan with some the military supplies of defensive nature, okay? So, and uh, defensive nature, I think, but the difference, another difference between Ukraine and Taiwan is that U.S. military supply to Ukraine is for, almost like for free. It's a gift, okay? It's a, you know, it's a means of, you know, the, the U.S. support. But for Taiwan's arms, um, sell, it's for sales, yeah. not supply, not, not, not for free. So we have purchased, you know, so many, you know, uh, uh, U.S. military supplies. The new yeah. Taiwan Policy Act might change that in terms of, you know, what will go in the well, NDA. Well, that still, remains to be still, that remains to, that remains to be seen, okay? Mm. Because now it has, has still, you know, stay in the in the parliament, in the Congress. We don't know. It has not, not been come up with a, with a real action. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, allow me, bear with me, uh, as, a, as a veteran, you know, uh, in the international uh, affairs officer who had to be based of in course, Washington, dealing with American policymakers and American congressmen, I, uh, I couldn't help but to be more practical and careful. Mm -hmm. But in terms of U.S. foreign policy, do you feel that there's more a focus 
on Taiwan in comparison to Ukraine in terms of U.S. national strategic interests? Do you feel well, yes. Okay, I think the U.S. Uh, you know, uh, given the current uh, you know the uh, the, the the challenge mm. in Ukraine and also the challenge in uh, over the Taiwan you know Strait area, so U.S. has to uh, deal with. Uh, both, you know, uh, uh, you know, challenging area in Ukraine. The war has been existing, mm. but the, uh, the the security threat in Taiwan Strait has not been okay. But it's it's kind of merging. Okay, the possibility is increasing. Okay, so the uh, threat is increasing. Mm. So, but the, uh, uh, the United States, okay, uh, they deal with according to the the, the recent uh, U.S. National Defense Strategy, mm. okay, NDS, mm. released just the last month by the defense you know, department mm. and also by the White House that uh, the United States classify both Russia and I think behind Ukraine and Taiwan is Russia and China. China. Yeah. So, so which one is more uh, threatening? Okay, more... Uh, so you you know, feel they're both important. That's right. The US, right. Okay, but U.S., uh, very interestingly, uh, the, this uh, you know, strategy report uh, classify U.S. as like an acute, acute what? Acute threat mm. to Russia. It's an acute threat. And uh, China is uh, facing challenges, mm. but despite despite the, the wording description of both powers, I think the but what uh, concerns me now is the U.S. policy toward China uh, has somehow, right after the last week, the recent twentieth Party Congress, mm. okay, yeah, as, as, as not the you know uh, uh, pleasingly to Taiwan, the U.S. steady their. Uh, attitude toward China. This somehow occur, occurring to me that they somehow has softened mm. their original stance on China in terms of urging, okay, urging uh, for a possible summit meeting between Xi Jinping and Biden. Mm. Some more dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, we'll touch a bit more on that in our next section. So um, okay. yeah. we just touched on the similarities and differences between Ukraine and Taiwan. Speaking of smaller democracies, Fighting against giant autocratic takeovers, let's now hear from Hanna Hopko, chairwoman of the Democracy in Action and former Ukrainian member of parliament and former head of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Hanna spoke to me earlier during her visit to Taipei with the Ukrainian parliamentary delegation about why a Ukrainian victory against the Russian takeover is so important to Taiwan security and how both countries are working together. Let's take a look. I'm very thankful to Taiwan for being with us from the first day of Russian full-scale escalation and genocide. We have uh, stand with Ukraine, but I would like to say win with Ukraine, because with your support and support of your people and other nations, we are winning now with uh, successes of counter-offensive of our armed forces. We are retaking uh, territories, returning control, and we are kicking out the occupiers from our land. And the more we receive from Taiwan, especially tougher sanctions on Russia, uh, also your help with chips to help us with drones, because Iran supported Russia, authoritarian regimes, China, North Korea, Belarus dictators allowing from Belarusian territory to attack us. So democracies has to support each other by providing technologies, humanitarian aid, because the fast we win, the less chances for authoritarianism to expand uh, their power. So victory of Ukraine is important also here, because it means that strategic clarity finally will be uh, at the uh, uh, international level regarding Taiwan. So we are very thankful, and we are also thankful for support local communities. Uh, people here uh, feel uh, your, your support in schools, hospitals, and actually uh, I, um, uh, our young generation, they are interested in working together. We had a very productive meeting with your Minister of Foreign Affairs, with your Minister of Digital Affairs, with your President, and we are so uh, thankful to your President and your uh, ministries uh, for discussing practical cooperation in the future. It's uh, education, it's science, it's uh, reconstruction efforts. Uh, in, in the future, I'm sure that uh, Taiwan will be present in rebuilding uh, Ukrainian factories, uh, um, also sharing experience in uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, we are also going to see your 
Shinju uh, Science Park and uh, learn uh, about you. And because, you know, Ukraine is also very advanced in digital uh, technologies. Uh, military are using also uh, higher t t technologies now, uh, different airspace um, and other uh, issues. So I think we are spiritual brothers. Uh, tech, uh, technically, we're also advanced and we have to exchange knowledge. And for the future, I hope to see a Taiwanese president in Crimea when we liberate it. And it means that China will think twice before attacking you, because uh, when Ukraine win, this is a powerful signal to all our authoritarian regimes. Do, do you feel that there will be more military cooperation between the two countries? I think we need uh, more uh, military cooperation and more security, uh, more uh, um, uh, um, how, to say, how to prevent cyber attacks, because Russia using hybrid methods, methods to infiltrate agents here, to use toxic propaganda, also to split societies and to do subversive acts, to provo provocation in the sea, what they've done before the uh, uh, annexation of Crimea and what they are doing also here. Uh, um, around uh, Taiwan Island in the uh, South China Sea and others. So China wants global dominance. It's not just about Indo-Pacific region or Taiwan. Taiwan they might use as a pretext for global war against democracies, against civilized nations. And this is why the faster Ukraine wins, the better chances for us to protect Taiwan and not to allow other, like Iran, to get uh, all nuclear uh, technologies from Russia. Also, to liberate uh, North Korea. So this is, there is a uh, geopolitical meaning from global perspective of Ukraine's victory. But without military cooperation, without your technologies, we need to be very proactive in not allowing Russian with Iranian drones to attack our critical infrastructure, our residential buildings. You just heard from Hannah Hopko, former Ukrainian MP and head of the Committee of Foreign Affairs, who spoke to Rath earlier about how her countries in Taiwan are working together on enhancing self-defense against the neighbor authoritarian giants. Let's now discuss how that cooperation could look like. Oleg, uh, Hannah just said Taiwan plays a key role in reconstructing Ukraine. And you are the founder uh, of Ukrainian Voices. I believe you talk to a lot of well, people from both sides. Do you see, well, they're getting more closer, closer as more understanding toward each other. And so they are willing to provide help in any kind of form to reconstructing the nation and vice versa? Well, yes. From the yes. very first moment of the invasion, Taiwanese people has showed massive support to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And not just the government, that of course, but uh, just, um, you know, big and small signs of solid solidarity coming from Taiwanese people everywhere. And since I was at the events such as, you know, peaceful protests mm. from the very beginning, fundraisers, everywhere there would be Taiwanese people who would come and offer support and offer donations. So that is happening a lot still. And we can see that um, specifically thanks to that in, in Ukraine, Taiwan is now more discussed. What's the reason behind Taiwan. such su support? What's the reason behind such, such, such support? Well, you would have to ask Taiwanese people, I feel like. From your observation. Yeah, but um, as, as a Ukrainian in Taiwan, I feel like a lot of that comes from, you know, seeing somehow Taiwan in Ukraine, seeing uh, themselves. So related know, and kind of yes. personal. Yes, so mm -hmm. uh, many people, for example, who would donate a lot of um, funds, they would say, you never know if it's going to be me tomorrow, I would want a Ukrainian person come to my help. Mm -hmm. So that kind of solidarity which, which uh, manifests a lot. Well, just that before this war ha happened, it, it's sort of, you know, far and distant and... and yeah in country for both sides. No one knew about Ukraine here. And in Ukraine, same, no one knew about Taiwan. You would ask people what Taiwan is. I mean, at most people would say something like, well, they claim China or they have, you know, disputes with China. Mm. Now there's a massive exchange we can see, not just politically. From civil as well. Yes, NGOs, um, everywhere. Cultural exchange, journalists travel here and there. A lot of Taiwanese journalists visited Ukraine yes. recently. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, members of Ukrainian civil society visiting Taiwan. Just next month, there's going to be a new group of people coming who are in, you know, not related even to politics. People just feel like they have more exchange with Taiwan mm. right now. More common platforms are opening, more conversations. It's not rare to see Taiwanese and Ukrainians come together as a guest on a show, let's mm -hmm. say a podcast. And um, mm. culture, I mean, exhibitions. There was a Ukrainian artist who gave an exhibition here, who direct here, uh, directly flew here to Taiwan. So in a way, this war draws you know, mutual understanding yes. from both countries. And exchange. Yeah, and exchange. Exchange mm. based on that understanding and solidarity. Mm. You yes. talked about more commonality, and perhaps this is because of a common goal. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, you know, not too long ago, um, the death of the first Taiwan um, private citizen that fought, you know, as a volunteer soldier in Ukraine, J Jonathan Thung. Yes. So with that, do you feel that there's even more, um, how do you say, like, um, realization of you know, the urge to defend one's homeland from that in both countries because of this incident? Yes. Well, first of all, I think it is an immense courage and dedication when you go to defend someone else's country. I mean, you need to have uh, such integrity in the values that you believe to be able to especially, you know, risk your life as Jonathan did in Ukraine. So yeah. he'll be remembered as Ukraine's hero forever. And Ukrainians are very good at remembering honoring our heroes. Mm, mm, mm. And of course, after this uh, tragedy happened, um, everywhere on Ukrainian news, in Ukrainian media spaces, people were talking about this Taiwanese soldier who came and paid his um, final sacrifice, unfortunately, for our country. Of course, people feel indebted and they feel like they need to you know, honor this in every way possible. So, of course, people are talking about Taiwan these days a lot. But even before this, whenever there's news about a new Taiwanese soldier coming to Ukraine, each time there's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of uh, discussion about that. People uh, applaud that in Ukraine. And people see that, well, there are some countries from where people do not come to fight for us. But Taiwan is not one of those countries. The people from Taiwan come to support us. Mm. There seems to be more um, exchange between people to people. Now, Ambassador, I wanted to ask you a bit more about official or, you know, military or government to government relations. Do you feel that there's going to be more cooperation? As, as Hannah mentioned earlier, she went to visit the Shinshu Science Park so that, you know, she can see which areas Taiwan can cooperate with Ukraine on in terms of cybersecurity, military technology. How do you see these ties or this type of cooperation going forward? Well, first, if I may follow up, you know, somehow on the, uh, you know, his words. Yes. Uh, that the, uh, speaking of the sy sympathy, okay, yes. the friendship support from Taiwanese to Ukrainians. As I always say, when I was in, uh, in the United States or in Africa for my ambassadorship, I say to the international audience that uh, although we are a small country. We have a big heart, mm. big heart, okay? So I think uh, given the outbreak of the, uh, in the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, I record that the, uh, some of my students, many of them, they express their you know, uh, output of sympathy toward the Ukrainians. And I, I can relate to that. I think, uh, as you know, that the Bible story of the David and Goliath mm. always can uh, draw you know, a lot of human you know, sympathy, human mm. support. And uh, sp secondly, speaking of the, uh, <clears throat> the commonality between okay, our two countries, at this moment, yes, uh, Taiwan and Ukraine have so much in common, okay, in many respects, at, at this moment. And uh, so I think that our bilateral relationship should be uh, perfectly complementary to each other. We deserve each other, mm. in other words. Now, so I think, although there remain, uh, uh, there remain certain hindrance, okay, between, okay, about the relationship between our two countries, I think we still can, uh, I can tell you honestly, it's not a secret anymore that since the, uh, the late 1990s, mm. at, on the eve of a millennium that, okay, after the, the, the Cold War, you know, is over, that uh, we uh, approached mm. uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian side. Okay, for kind of a, you know, uh, you know. We approached them. Uh, well, I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't go any further, all right? Mm. Can I stop here? Okay, our efforts, have been well received by the Ukrainian side. Mm. However, as you can, okay, you can uh, imagine that China, when the China heard of that, they stand get in the way right away. Okay, so uh, could that be happen? Okay, 
Uh, so we keep trying uh, several times in the past uh, over 20 years. And uh, now I think uh, still, so given those, uh, you know, the political hindrance, mm. okay, line between our two peoples, we still can, uh, uh, you know, work out a certain common ground from our, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, our similarities. Maybe some like, for, for example, academic exchanges. Yeah, several. And, uh, yeah, you know. as well as less political, non-political. Mm. And as well as some like agriculture, agriculture. Yeah, that's different level, right? Yeah, Economic between our two sides. Because yeah. we both have strengths in agriculture, you know, mm -hmm. products, export, export, and some other, you know, strengths from Ukraine that can serve, you know, uh, the benefit, serve the interest of Taiwan as well. And that's very saying over the past 20 years, we've been trying to reaching out. Yeah. But just only after the war that such exchange had happened more and more. Well, more after, frequent. after, you know, the fall of Berlin, Berlin War, oh. 1990s. Wow. Okay, so wow. I, I think uh, right, right after the Cold War era was over in the, in the 1990s. So we've the been century, reaching out. Uh, we've been reaching out, I think. Oh. Uh, that's, uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, you know, that, that, that demonstrates our sincerity. Well, like, we approach Ukrainians. I see. And now we're still, well, I think, uh, uh, given we're the- We're still going to the same direction. I, I shouldn't be surprised that, mm -hmm. if not given the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. I think it's a relationship, Taiwan, you know, uh, we have uh, the people are very kind, kind-hearted, our mm -hmm. people. I'm always, uh, Proud of my our people's, you know, kind hearted. So I think we should go further. But uh, still, still, the China staying the way. Yeah. So but you do feel that there might be more military or technological cooperation uh, military, in the midst of China. And, military you know, with cooperation. China. I, I yeah. wouldn't say that. But let's say go step bit by bit. Okay, step by step. But it, we might eventually get there. Is what you're trying to say? Oh uh, well, <laughs> anything is possible. Right. Okay. Right. But start from the from the very very beginning. It, it, it's great how you mentioned China because um, Ukraine was. China was actually Ukraine's largest trading partner in 2020, sure. but yeah. you know that has significantly dropped. And um, you know, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, exports to um, you know between both countries have dropped. And if you look at you know, it fell to only 20 percent of the prior year to the <coughs> in the first half of 2022. Do you feel that's an opportunity for Taiwan in terms of trade? Because with less trade reliance that we've seen, you know, with Lithuania, they're more might be more willing to forge that official mm -hmm. or say mm -hmm. more, you know, pronounced relationship? Sure, of course. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think at this moment, the more Ukrainian people will be informed, will can realize that, can be convinced of the Taiwan's this friendship. I think that will give more opportunity, give a motivation for our, you know, uh, you know continued efforts in this regard. Uh, still, I think, uh, you know, the Ukrainian people should also realize that uh, China uh, tried very hard to stop us from getting closer to each other mm. over the past over 20 years. Uh, but look at, you know, how the China's, you know, reaction toward, you know, Ukrainians themselves. And after the, the Ukrainians feel betrayed because. That's right, yeah. I, I, I think they should be, uh, you know, better informed. They should can get, better, get a better understanding of what China is up to. Mm. Okay, this time, mm. as you can see that, given all the information report and all the, the news report that China is one of the very few countries, if any, in the world, which are, stands by, keep standing by Russia, okay, okay. And then, the, you know, uh, even for, the, for the, all, the, all the countries that uh, sanctioned against, you know, you, you know Russia, mm. China would not join them. So I think that the China has only one thing in mind, their political interest. They don't care about the, the, the casualties yes. of hundreds of thousands of uh, Ukrainians, and the, damages. And life, the, mm. the loss of their lives, also their deteriorating economy. They don't care about, they care about Okay, what China is interested is. And, it's and great the, you mentioned that. And Oleg, do you feel that um, perception towards China has changed in Ukraine? Do you feel that you know there's more hostility now, as the ambassador mentioned? For know, sure, I completely yeah. agree with Ambassador Chow. Yes, in in the Ukrainian society, you can see this massive change, and the massive realization that China was not by us in this worst of time. As they say, you know your true friend in the you know in the bad of time. But in reality, so, it's yes. the opposite. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Yes, no. and I feel like China one. failed that role for Ukraine, despite being one of the major trade partners. Yeah, but it's interesting that you say you come to realization of nature of China, but in the same time, after the Russian invasion, I think Ukraine has become more willing to embrace uh, the idea of democracy, of more pro progressive principles like, uh, you know, gender, in terms of gender, woman power, same-sex marriage, do you see that sort of change, change after this war? 
I think this is one of the traits of Ukraine's history and mentality. People who were, you know, they were pretty much enslaved by Russia, Soviet Union before. Mm -hmm. Now, after the independence, they start to realize their power. They realize that they now have tools to, you know, influence their country. They realize they better. have the power to determine their, their own future. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it happened in 1991. It happened after the revolution in 2004, then revolution in 2014 and first invasion. And now especially, I feel like people, they first of all, they rallied around the idea of democracy now and more people tend to realize how it's important that people actually demand the change they want. And that leads to more embracing of uh, more progressive ideas, mm -hmm. well, not just politi politically. Mm -hmm. That would have to be researched, of course, how the mm -hmm. ideas you, about, especially, you know, those first issues instinct, that yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. But uh, in the um, general atmosphere, generally, I feel like, yes, because there's mm. more solidarity in the society mm -hmm. and more mm -hmm. visibility. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about women in the army, because armed forces are traditionally one of the most discriminatory towards women institutions in the country. Now we have between 20 to 30 percent of our military mm -hmm. being women. So, of course, that inevitably leads to people realizing that, OK, well, women in the army is a norm and well, Everyone, despite of their gender, who has the capacity, yeah. and dedication, can be defending they're, the country. They're allowed, and of course, they can, right? Yes. The reason why I specific mention those traits and uh, well, trends is because those are the same values that Taiwanese society yes. also cherishes. Do you think there's a the, there's a sink, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It brings us closer. I feel like it manifested Taiwan pride when Kyiv yeah. pride was officially represented uh, by our organization, and we had massive support at Taiwan Pride as a Ukrainian team Ukraine uh, oh. because even uh, like like women also LGBTQ soldiers are now becoming more visible in the army which is one of the reasons why that petition to President Zelensky to legalize same-sex marriage now gains so much support. and he has talked about it you know I think he it did. brings him closer to the EU as well and Yes. As that's another goal. And Ukraine. he directly responded yeah. to the petition in a favorable way. He said that it needs to be done, although right now we cannot because we cannot amend constitution during war. But he said that he's instructed his government to work on a solution, especially mm. to accommodate same-sex soldiers. Because, you know, as a same-sex partner, oh. you cannot claim a body, you cannot claim inheritance, you cannot attend to your loved one at a hospital, which many soldiers are facing right now. We just spoke about how both countries, Taiwan and Ukraine, and their people can work together on a common goal, defending against an invading authoritarian superpower. Let's now turn to Mykola Najajski, Ukrainian member of parliament and co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China. Mykola spoke to our chief host, Inka Vat, on China during his visit to Taipei as part of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China delegation here. Let's take a look. Some of our businessmen have relation with China, but uh, democracy politician in Ukraine pressure for our government, and we change our position and we synchronize now our position with position of European country. So, despite the the war in your own country, you've come all the way to Taiwan to stand in solid solidarity with us. Ukraine, like Taiwan, is on the front lines of democracy. Uh, all our people is solidarity with Taiwan's people. All from us watching TV when Pelosi come here, all from us worry about Taiwan's because we know that Taiwan support Ukraine. When I come here, I have a big Ukrainian flag and building in Taipei. It's very important for us. And now we feeling what is uh, have the war with big country, for example, Russia have territory in 28 more than Ukraine. Uh, Russia, uh, population of Russia in four times more in Ukraine. Uh, it looks like between China and Taiwan. Uh, we are more smaller, but our people uh, defend his land and his motherland. It's like war between David and Goliath. Uh, it's why we win in the front. Army, army win a uh, uh, Russian's army. It was second army in the world. Of course, we know that uh, European democracy and United States 
support us and need to support us. And I hope that all this country also will be supporting Taiwan. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we see that now Russia, they can win us in the front, but they use his rocket, his, his weapons against civilians. They try to destroy our energy system. Uh, they try to uh, deport our people from occupied territory. Mm. But I know that we win and we need to try uh, to do all what is possible uh, to support in Taiwan. Mm. Maybe if uh, Chinese Communist Party or Xi Jinping will know that European country is united and all democracy country, United States, European country, supporting Taiwan, maybe it stop him. I think that we can stop all aggressive thinking against Taiwan. You just heard from Mykola Nochiski, Ukrainian member of parliament, during his trip to Taiwan on the importance of working together to tackle an increasingly assertive China, among others rising authoritarian. Now let's discuss the challenge and the contest of both Taiwan and Ukraine. Ambassador, I'm really curious about what's China's true attitude toward Russia, because from not so long ago, China has uh, this economic support for Russia and said we have unlimited support for Russia. But not just so after Germany's prime minister visited Beijing, they co-signed a de declaration asking it is not to use nuclear weapons in the war against Ukraine. So what is the, the nature of their friendship between China and Russia? What is the signal that Beijing is sending to uh, Russia? Well, uh, well, it's made the long story short. Okay, mm. that calls for a long talk, but made the long story short that the the China has, and Russia, they their relationship, uh, well, uh, they have a, you know the same background because they are one thing in common between Russia and the two giants because they are all anti-America at this moment. So anti-American, you know, ideology mm. or sentiment that put them t closer together now. So I think. So speaking of the nuclear warfare, yeah. okay, China can support Russia to a certain extent. Mm. Okay, as, we, we, as to far a as the, the to a certain extent, what is that as far extent? as the, I think for a nuclear warfare, that would that would be beyond the, the red line. So I think, that, yeah, as you know, that any nuclear warfare applied to uh, to Ukraine, I think that that will have great impact by the Chinese. Believe that great impact not only uh, geographically. On the border of uh, you know China, yes. or, but also you know in the in the geopolitical position, China has held so dear to its uh, international leadership that will have impact on our international interest. So I can, you, you can go go further than that. But so why I do think. they have to say this now? Do they do you see Beijing see this is coming so that they have to put a stop? Well, I think that as, as you know that all, all the, the international perception goes that you know there, there might be a nuclear war coming up. Uh, okay, the, the threat has been there, and let alone, you know, let alone that some dirt, dirty you know uh, bombs you know mm. come. So I think the China say they are taking advantage of the German Chancellor Scholz visit this time yes. to say that in, to to the world that taking this opportunity. That's right. Yeah, because you know because Scholz. Okay, I think according to the news report. Uh, Chancellor Scholz had publicly asked China to get involved in helping, you know, uh, mediating the, 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 the war the in war, Ukraine. Yeah. That's right, to st help to stop the war, okay, from going on. So I think China said, China said okay, well, a certain con condition, I say, in, but Russia had to reconsider its original strategy of launching to uh, some nuclear warfare. I think it's like, uh, you know, because uh, it's a you know, speaking moment, I think it's an occasion, they would like to take advantage of that, mm -hmm. used to that. So I think that's a timely warning. I think that served, timely warning. That mm -hmm. served the interest of the whole world. Okay, I mean, China, so, well. So what are you saying, China's getting points? Well, in, in this international perception. That's right. I think uh, you know all the indication. I think uh, ever since a couple of months ago, since uh, March or fourth, uh, April. I'm saying the uh, other words. You know, uh, uh, attention that uh, they they say. Look at all the all the countries at stake now in the world. That the one of the only one of the few countries who is uh, capable, which is capable and willing to stop the war from going on. Big power, first several 
requirement, first big power, and second qualification that this country, this party, has to be believed, has to be believed, convinced by both Ukraine and Russia. Mm. So narrow down this category, I think China remains only one of the very few choices. Now this time, a lot of American media, New York Times economists, according to my memory, they have repeatedly asked China to get involved in helping, okay? So I think let alone that some of the, the you know, the, 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 the uh, several in American sympathy, American support mm. for, the, uh, for the Ukraine has been somehow, you know, uh, you know uh, shrink, you know, mm. so, so far. Mm -hmm. I think at this moment that China, but they're, they're trying to use the best opportunity, the best timing to get involved. Mm. So far, Xi Jinping doesn't have never, has never confirmed that they were willing to do that. But I think the, the timing is, is here. So uh, uh, let alone that, you, you mentioned, Russ mentioned about the no limit friendship. No limit friendship. Yeah. I can tell you honestly that uh, uh, there's no such things of a no limit friendship mm -hmm. in the conduct of international diplomacy. Okay, let alone that the Russia and China, their uh, you know relation by relationship has always been the kind of a uh, uh, fair weather, mm. fair weather. Kind yeah, of it, friendship. It's great how you mentioned that, but. I, it's, Wanted to go back to China's role and, yeah. you know, with Russia, given that, you know, Taiwan and Ukraine are both caught in between. And, and Alexa, if you could share a bit about how, say, both countries are big tech giants. Mm -hmm. How do you feel Taiwan's silicon shield and mm. Ukraine's technology can work together to deter, say, potential, you know, Russian aggression? It's, you know, it's already in the country, but further this. aggression, also yeah. mm -hmm. potential Chinese aggression in terms of mm. an invasion mm. on the island here. Mm. You're saying technology. Technology and, and uh, other areas. It, well, given there's more mistrust now in, mm. in, in China, within the Ukraine populace. I mean, technology cooperation between Ukraine and Taiwan, it's, it's way far in the future, I feel like. Because we are just now starting to realize uh, how the things are. And as, but as much as we wish that Ukraine adopted a more values-based trade economy, uh, I think that after the war, Ukraine is going to be very desperate for aid. And that's oh. where China will try to, you know, step in. So cooperation is still a little bit down, a little bit down the road. It's not happening yet. Right yes. now, Ukraine needs more help. Yes. Ukraine but do you feel that there's going to be an increased role for Taiwan? In I do China. feel and I do hope. I think that Taiwan, the best thing Taiwan can do right now, well, besides, you know, supporting whatever initiatives are happening between our countries, to also step in as, um, with Taiwan's humanitarian presence. Mm. That I think could be really the key for Taiwan to enter Ukraine and to increase its presence and the economy trade will come up in terms of healthcare. Exactly. <coughs> healthcare. Basically doing what Taiwan is doing right now, but, you know, with more presence in Ukraine because Ukrainian people need to see that Taiwan is there for Ukraine. Well, even when China is willing to help, well, infrastructure.